everyone. My name is Melissa Forziat. I'm a keynote speaker and the host of this Halt and Catch Fire rewatch podcast. Now, when I speak, my topic is something that I call Take the Donut, which for me is another way to say carpe diem. Go after the things that you want in life. And something I wanted to do this year was rewatch the show Halt and Catch Fire, but this time talk about it with other people. I initially meant fans of the show and then I started doing interviews with cast and crew and I'm even up leveling that now because I'm getting a chance to do a whole bunch of interviews here at the ATX festival in Austin where this weekend we have had a 10-year anniversary for the show Halt and Catch Fire. What an exciting weekend this has been and I am so honored to share with you this next interview with the one and only Carrie Bechet who played Donna Clark slash Donna Emerson across all four seasons of the show. What an incredible interview. Um, and I just wanted to give you one heads up that we had a friend to join us. And who is that friend? If you've been listening to the podcast, get ready to welcome Evan the Stray. Um, actually, Evan has joined me for this entire weekend. And we've been working on getting all this coverage for you. And there's, you know, even more to come than what you've already seen. But uh, what a blast to meet him in person. This was all part of the plan to begin with, to talk about this show with other people. And to make a friend out of it has been so wonderful. And um, Evan did some very good legwork to make sure that we got this interview with Carrie. And Carrie was like, Evan, you gotta be in the interview. And I was like, you, yes, sit right here in the middle of us. And I don't think Evan was expecting that, but uh, it was really fun to have him in that setting. And as you, as the interview goes on, it was really fun to see him kind of bloom into it. And so I hope that you all really enjoy this interview with Carrie, who has obviously thought a lot and feels deeply about her experience on the show. And um, that's something that Evan and I, and I, I think, both came away from as a result of this interview. We were talking about it over dinner, and uh, what a blast this was. One quick point, this is a spoiler-filled interview. All of the interviews are spoiler-filled, but just be aware of that up front. And having said all that, enjoy this chat with Carrie Bechet. Oh. All right, everybody, here we are with Carrie Boucher and Evan the Stray. Hello. Um, so excited to be talking with Carrie here, who, okay, we know you played Donna Clark, Donna Emerson, not sure which name you prefer at this point. <laughs> um, Donna has the, such an incredible transformation in this show. Where she starts is definitely not where she ends. Um, you know, we see her at first homemaker, but also has a full-time job. But then over time, like the job becomes more of the prominent focus in her life. Um, what were you seeing as the through lines for Donna all the way through? I think Donna had a real need to prove herself. I think there was this sense that, um, she'd been sort of put in a little box and I think she was always trying to um, break out of the box. Um, I think that was like a big motivating thing for her in her relationships um, and in her work. Mm. One scene that really highlights or punctuates that for me is when we get to season four, there's a co-parenting dinner between Gordon and Donna where you're talking about, you know, just the updates. And Donna has full on run with a project that Gordon had initially presented the idea for. Donna doesn't know that they're working on Comet, which is Haley's project. But she's doing a competing project now and shares that with Gordon. So at this dinner, Gordon says, yeah, our daughter's working on that. And I gasped because at this point in the show, I actually felt that Donna could slit her own daughter's throat. She was so savage. How did you think about getting her to that place? Um, I, I was sort of of two minds about it. Um, I... Uh, struggled with the things 
with some of the, you know, like, like Donna's villain arc, you know, um, because I love her and I want her to make good choices. And it was sort of hard having to always stand in her shoes and like kind of keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Um, so that's like a little bit painful. And as an actor, what a gift, what a gift. Um, especially when, uh, having started where we did, which is, you know, Donna in the kitchen complaining about the salt shakers, you know, um, to get to be um, such a multifaceted, uh, deep, complicated, genius, vain uh, person is uh, really rare. I think um, we don't like to see ourselves that way and um, television has a way of sort of flattening characters they have to seem more consistent I think um, and so that the Chris's let her be all of the things a person can be it was like incredibly liberating actually um, and you know I I don't know if I knew at the time because they would keep story points from us um, and you know her her villain arc was a great way to like dig her kind of down into the dirt and then Donna gets a really satisfying like redemption story at the end um and the the further down in the in the muck you get to put a person um the more satisfying the redemption is at the end so I love actually hearing as hard as it may have been in the moment um to be in a position feeling like I could slit my own daughter's throat right now, <laughs> you know, um, really exciting to hear you say that that's also what you received, you know, because um, what a what a win for us all. It's one of those moments where somebody not familiar with the show watching my reaction would have been like, this is just a conversation. There's no bullets flying, like it's fine. And like, but, but there's like a real gravity <laughs> to the situation and it's beautiful the way that you put that. You know, Gordon and Donna go on quite a ride. And obviously the first two seasons, we see her almost sort of emotional affair. We see him have a one night stand actual physical affair. They survive those things. But in the end, they do make a decision to split. What do you think keeps them together when they decide to stay together? And what do you think is finally what makes them say, we've probably done enough? Um, it's hard to say. Uh, as much as the show is about relationships, um, I think the thing the show chooses to dramatize is the, the romance that people have with their work, with their work and their ideas. And um, the, like, I, I wonder if what that means then is that if you're working in a world where the main priority for the people is the things they get to work on and do together, um, that is the driving passion for them, then the like romantic partnerships have to take second place, um, that they're less important. So I guess I'd say, you know, before the story starts, Donna and Gordon have passionately engaged. Part of their courtship, I think, was inventing things together. They had the symphonic, um, their early project together. And I think the thing that keeps them going is, uh, the thing that keeps them together is that idea of collaborating on a project um, and once that comes to its end the relationship comes to an end that's sort of the universe that these guys built and that they all inhabited so um, yeah and her true like you know creative partner like for life obviously is Cameron mm -hmm. um, and that's where all the like the energy is, is going and the marriage uh, you know ends up being unnecessary I'm really excited to ask you a Cameron Donna question I just want to brace you because I didn't tell Evan about this but you're going to get an Evan's choice question a little bit later so I want you to give some thought to what what do you want to know about Donna um, give us some thought I'll come back to you I know I can't just spring this on you um, 
But with Cameron and Donna, my absolute favorite detail, among many favorite details of the series, is that Cameron has created a game that only Donna can win. It is the most beautiful thing just to sit with that. Um, and it shows to me the strength of their bond. Talk to me about Cameron and Donna. What is that bond between them? Uh, I just, sorry, I, you keep mentioning these like details of um, episodes and I'm having like, she like flashbacks. No, no, Milgram. no, no, no. Yeah. You don't have to tell me yeah. about like, it. Oh, I'm, I'm there. I'm uh, living yeah, I'm it like, right yes, now. Yeah. Hold on. Um, <laughs> the, um, the writer of that episode um, was there when we were filming it. Um, mm. It was all description. Um, we, when, when we were filming it, it's I'm playing the game um, and I'm encountering all of these things, but we don't, they're gonna put those in special effects later. So there's nothing for me to see. Um, so there's just, it's the most boring shot. It's just like the, the camera's on me and I'm reacting to playing this game. Um, and I was like, I need to, hear it. I need to hear it and I need the timing right. So we had her read what she'd written, the description of what I was seeing in the game so that I knew when to respond and what to respond to um, and what was happening fictionally on the screen. Um, and uh, by the end, like the whole crew was in tears <laughs> just to hear nothing was happening it was me watching a screen the most boring shot in the world um and someone reading the description of what happened in the game and it was so uh moving really beautiful i love that it's love a perfect that example of what an actor can do because to describe it doesn't sound like a lot but like when you think about that detail and what it actually means it's so much bigger than you looking at a blank screen. <laughs> you know, like, the fact that that could come alive as much as it did is just amazing. Well, I think I have soft eyes. I think I just have, like, a gentle face. I think that does a lot of work. <laughs> um, and I think it's really more about knowing how little to do. I think what you're responding to is really great writing. I think, you know, developing those characters over time, you really amazing that you could be so invested in a character. All you're watching is my face not doing much, but you know the implication of what's happening. You know the, the power of it. You're realizing. What it means is this other person was so devoted, even in their estrangement from each other, um, that she couldn't help herself but sort of like um, in, invent this this like she is she is a puzzle that this that only this other person can solve um, and and you're watching them you're watching proof that they're meant for each other um, while simultaneously seeing the uncrossable uh, divide between them so painful mm. I love the relationship between Diane and Donna and you know <laughs> Diane is sort of you've said like sort of the role model figure for Donna there's a scene in season four where Diane sort of puts Donna in her place and she's like you're yelling at your team you're being mean to this person you're like maybe don't do that and I think with anybody else in the show Donna would push back Donna would fight back and she does not with Diane she listens what is it about that connection with Diane that gets through to Donna well, Annabeth is just so, like, civilized. Don't you want Annabeth to like you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just do. <laughs> um, I just want her to like me and approve, you know? Um, I think there's something about Annabeth, you know, that makes me want to not disappoint her. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's, that's Donna's... Like, this is the first time Donna's had an idea of where she might like to go, an example of, of who she might like to become. I think she struggled early on trying to find um, a template for herself. There wasn't anybody doing what she wanted to do um, that, that was a woman. Um, and so to uh, meet this person who is gracefully, elegantly, um, succeeding at this thing, I think, was very powerful. Mm. 
I'd like to explore a little bit more about Donna's mother, her, her journey here. I mean, she at times is reluctant to be perceived as a mom, but still is nurturing to everybody bes- despite that. Um, she kind of can't help but be the mom in like the mutiny house. What is that relationship to motherhood for her? And does that evolve for you as the series goes on? Um, yeah, so um, the mom thing is uh, like a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. That's it. <laughs> um, <laughs> the black is a trap. It's, it's a, a trap. Cross. Stop. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a trap for people in real life um, in America in 2024. It's a trap for TV characters. Um, um, it's so hard to be perceived as something else. It's other than just a mom. It's so hard for that to not be the one and only main um, priority for a character in the way that a man can be a father, but that doesn't have to be the main defining thing about his character. Um, we hold moms to different standards than we do to people who are not moms. Um, I, I was really nervous signing on to this show that she was going to be, um, she'd pop in for a handful of scenes and complain about dinner um, and she'd be sort of a symbol of something and not like a real full person because that's what television does to moms and that's honestly what the world does to moms um, and she so so Donna is really really fighting that the whole time and I actually really love that she that they she got pitted against her own kid in that's a really good potent good storyline I think um, really uh, like the two biggest priorities in her life are now suddenly completely diametrically opposed um, so yeah you know and then I think there's there's moments where she escapes being perceived that way. She is inhabiting a different uh, sphere, and yet her own, um, the way she sees herself, she can't help but but believe she's being perceived that way. So, um, yeah, it's like it's a that's like a tough. A tough question. Um, I just came from a, a panel about reproductive rights, and we talked all about an episode where Donna gets an abortion, um, and it's at the end of that episode, I think, that uh, <laughs> she sings the song from Dumbo, "Baby Mine," mm-hmm. to um, Haley on the phone. It is. Um, it kills me. It kills me dead every time. Um, her like you know her like really struggling family her husband just had an affair I think in that episode and um, you know and they're like on, on this like the tenuous little the like the curly like phone wire you know <laughs> just like holding on to this like uh, like trying to keep it all together and it's so wonderful that that song ends up really playing pretty significant foreshadowing role in season five. For some reason, people get surprised that Gordon dies, but we couldn't have led up to it any more than we did in the show, I think. In you're a lot of ways. season two, you're spoiling it for everyone. Well, they know that the interviews are spoiler-filled. <laughs> um, yeah, the, it's amazing to me like how many different things are planted in season four, and that song comes up a bunch of different times. Gordon's trying to remember what the song is. He's humming it to somebody. He's tapping it out on a phone. Um, so that scene has so much resonance and it kind of brings that episode back, you know, into the forefront of our minds seasons later. Yeah. 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 Now I have a few more questions, but I just wanted to, Evan's choice. Are you ready? Sure. I've got a few floating around my head. Well, you know, you want that really impactful thing and I don't know if I'm going to get it on the spot really, but (laughs) like, and this kind of goes back to the panel, um, you know, your concern of being kind of, I don't want to use the word marginalized as just like the mom character in season one. So, was that completely autonomously like your choice to go with your brother and disassemble various electronic items to like, um, uh, I'll use the term strong arm, um, and sh- display a prowess that wasn't necessarily written in the role, or is that like an assigned preparatory? No, no. Um... I think the only assigned 
preparatory research work that we got was, I think they asked us all to read the um, Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs. Mm. Um, so I think we all had read that. Um, and everything else was extracurricular. Um, I, I asked my brother to set me up with his friend Dick Whitney, um, a really amazing computer scientist and kind of art, crazy artist person. Um, and yeah, I like ordered speak and spells off eBay and I like brought, I was like, Hey, I like brought them to the props department. I was like, I don't know if you need extras, but I have some speak and spells. <laughs> um, some of that stuff was written into the script. It, you know, the, in the script, it's like Donna pops off the back of the speak and spell. And then it was, I, I really made it important. And I remember Juan, the director being like, it's fine if you struggle with it, it's okay. Like we'll make it look good in editing. I was like, no, no, no. It, like it has to be so good. Um, so I, I, we did, we like really worked with it and so that I knew what to do. So it made it look like I was like a real pro. No, it comes through. Cause like, I, I don't know if I can remember back 10 years, but on the first watch, I'm going to say probably, but I know in all the watches since, like, I see that scene, and there's, I'm, I don't know that I'm necessarily expecting, like, what Juan said was okay, but, like, it's very clearly demonstrated that you know what you're doing with, like, a fine screwdriver, popping the back off, and yeah, that can be rehearsed, but, you know, I don't know. It was, it, it, it felt really real um well and i also thought i was like i don't know how many chances i'm gonna get to show the audience that she's a genius i have to take advantage of every chance i get and i couldn't believe that story that cantwell told um <laughs> that was it cantwell said that in the uh, earlier today that he was like all that stuff that scene that we watched that one clip um where i'm literally going through telling her what the parts of the machine are he was like that was your idea <laughs> you told us that you wanted to like it was important that you like explain to her what is going on in the machine so we like looked up all that stuff and like it's all like written in the margin of the <laughs> thing because you asked us to do it i was like oh my god that's awesome I'm so glad i did that <laughs> You also mentioned Juan Campanella, and I just wanted to mention that I had interviewed him. You uh, did? Yeah, I did. <laughs> what interview. a cool interview. Uh, My goodness. Why? He told us stuff that was like, um, apparently the visual style for the show was based on Rochenko photos. It's like, whoa. And then all these people watching the podcast started deep diving into Rochenko, because it's like, oh, that is the visual <laughs> style of the show. So just like, I think Well, Juan some had some visual ideas that were established in the pilot that didn't always get followed through on in the rest of the show, um, which is just the way it goes. It's like a really organic um, kind of thing. Uh, and I loved learning all the different stuff that directors could bring to it. I shadowed a director, I um, shadowed Phil Abraham, um, who is just phenomenal, and he comes from the camera world. Um, and so I sat with him while he was doing all of his like prep work. He writes himself like a novel over here, like the light glints off the crumbling column and we see the blah, 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 like a whole novel. And then he's like, yeah, I'm gonna do that with the, and this is how I'll do it with the camera and that's how that'll be. Um, and I did not like Phil when I first met him. He is kind of like, um, he's like pretty cold and pretty direct. And I was like, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> you know, and he's, all of his ideas, cause it comes from the camera world are very practical. You know, he's like, oh, you could stand up there, but the lighting looks so much better if you're sitting, you know? <laughs> and I'm kind of like, oh, can you make the lighting look good standing up? But like, it's, he's, I actually love that he's so practical and um, he's a good friend now. And um, I just have such great, respect for him so that that's also really fun to see like the through line and the continuity and then also kind of like the new the differences mm. may i really quick oh or is this let's like, do evan's choice too uh, well, go well oh, yeah. okay so i feel like we're just this question i know we've discussed it yeah. but um there it's maybe um episode six or seven in season one and um let me the credit right uh, so in terms of lighting there's a very like you know vibrant red, you know, whatever, your hair color, through the show, um, uh, especially in season one at least. I'm sorry. Anyways, so there's a scene where you're on the phone with Hunt, your the peach pie. manager, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and 
there is a very, and maybe it's just me wanting to attribute something to it, but at that point, um, you may have to keep me honest here, have they gone on the business trip to... It's before, okay, it's so right before, before. Okay. but he's starting to flirt, and it's like, pie. why is he trying to flirt uh, mm-hmm, now? Mm-hmm. And the, the scene, like I said, it seems so contrasting to every other, every other scene you're in. Your hair almost looks like, I don't want to say like jet black, but it's very dark. <laughs> and I'm like, is this like to like symbolize your, I don't know, your thoughts and feelings at the time and you leaning into his flirtation so there's like almost like the, this darkness, darkness enveloping mm-hmm, you from, from, mm-hmm. from that like marital. Yes, um, yeah. Like, so... Was that a discussion? Was that, like, at least to your knowledge, like, like we're doing this lighting to... Um... The lighting in the show, especially in the first season or two, was very, very dark. Okay. The lighting in general, very dark. Um, I think that's super cool. Uh, I think it made it kind of, like, edgy and... So specific to that scene, though, you're not like. I don't think okay. I don't think I know specifically to that scene. I I remember that set so well. That was like such an insane house set. It was so lived in and mm. so detailed, um, and like the pass through from the kitchen, just like the really cool opportunity for shots or like we could do long shots in there. We did like. Um, a handful of really cool oneers that I thought were really fun and you could get really cool angles because you could get like stuff in the foreground and through the thing and then the dining was over here um I'm trying to remember maybe it was like also I was probably like sneaking around on the phone maybe late at night mm-hmm. maybe that's part of why the, the darkness but I like your interpretation of it sort of like her moral Thank descent you. you know right after that <laughs> did you go and play um was it the symphonic that you you played it's just, garage, like right okay. it's just a keyboard. It's just a keyboard. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Her, right. her musical past. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. Let's talk a little bit about. I'm so curious about the Donna Joe dynamic. So, Donna, especially in season one, says the most scathing things about Joe. J- Donna seems to know exactly who Joe is. I mean, at one part, at one point, um, refers to him as like a tall, dark mannequin with delusions of grandeur. <laughs> Um, like she tells it like it is and in season two we see moments where Cam wants to have her back up with it but Donna's like well from a business standpoint maybe when we get all the way to the end of season four um, we're gonna see Joe's desk at the school he's now a teacher and he's got some pictures of people but Donna is not on it but Gordon is and Cameron is but I feel like you've had these important moments with each other and you're a major part of each other's lives. So I don't know. What do you see that Donna Joe relationship as being? Um, I, I, I always found it to be like, it was going to be a puzzle for these guys to keep all these characters connected after so long. Um, and with the things that had happened between Donna and Joe, I think that was particularly... It would be far-fetched for Joe at the end to have come around so much on Donna. You know, uh, I think there's important people in your life, but you don't want to have a picture of them on your desk at the end of the day. Um, I think maybe they were um, interesting foils for each other, ultimately. I think there's a lot of, like, respect there and... um, but too threat, too threatening, ultimately too threatening. And like, you got to think like Donna's not there, but the two most important people in her life are there on his desk. Um, so there's got to be something, maybe, too close for comfort about about each other or something like that. Mm. We've got a couple more questions, and I'll just keep them broad. You've worked on all different sets before what stood out to you as being different about working on this show um the commitment that every single person had to making it the absolute best thing it could be starting with i mean the chris's obviously this was like their their baby um and then 
the actors, I mentioned this earlier, but um, we would get together and do our own table reads and like, it would be like a full day of rehearsal on a day off. Um, people would be out of town and fly back early so that we could do these um, table reads. And they were like table read rehearsal work session, like, you know, five, six hours um, on a Sunday. Um, and that is ridiculous. That's completely ridiculous. I can't imagine another group of people who would agree to do that <laughs> in their free time. Um, and it wasn't even just about like yourself. It was about committing to making the show as good as we could and everybody kind of being on the same page. And um, that's like, I, I just think that's so unique. Oh, that's so beautifully said. I've told you about a couple of my favorite moments in the show. What were some of your favorite scenes? Some things that just, when you think about it now, it just touches you. Um, we watched a clip earlier of the, um, the scene from the episode, and she was when Donna's at Diane's house and wanders the ground after she took mushrooms, um, and lays down in the grass and has this sort of this conversation with Cameron and you think, oh my God, Cameron showed up. And then um, it zooms in on Donna's face and then when you pull back out again, uh, Cameron's gone and it was it had been a figment of her imagination. And um, I love, I love that scene. I love that scene for Donna. It's, um, you know, the rare time that we get to see her interior life. Um, and, it, it's it's a little wish fulfillment, you know. You're getting to see what she wishes she could say, but can't. Um, and then there's also I do love um, this is a story I already told, so forgive me for repeating myself. But um, that my stand-in was I don't know somewhere else or something happened, and she <laughs> didn't know what I had been doing, and it this shot was so important, um, the timing and really mattered. Um, and so the camera assistant was like, I know it, I can do it. And he stepped in and, and walked my, did the rehearsals for the camera so that they could get all the um, timing and the positioning accurately. And he um, was just so good at his job, he could do somebody else's job better than they could. Um, and that, it matters so much to the camera for them to be good at their job to like, it, it was just this like really exquisite moment of like, of teamwork and um, it, it, it could make me cry. He was so devoted to doing this thing and doing it so well. And you know, he's like running his hands through the grass just the way I did. It was like so um, moving and sweet and, um, yeah, that's the day I remember. I don't know. I mean, you know, it was like, it was my whole life for years. It's hard to, um, hard to pick any one thing. The whole episode when Gordon dies, the flashback when Gordon dies, all of the, the way that Gordon died, I thought was so beautiful. And there's also like, right before there's this like gentle thing where like walking through, he like kind of sees me walking through the house. Um, but I think I'm already like in the, the like flashback to when we first meet. And that's also really fun that like late in the series you get this like, and it's like half the episode. It's like a huge amount of that episode is us when we first had our first kid together and he kind of like walks out and um, it's just like, I, I loved that. That um, baby was Melissa Bernstein's baby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were talking about that today. They were like, you know, I like had to make her cry. <laughs> she was Aww. supposed to cry in some of the scenes and I was like, oh my God, what am I supposed to like make my boss's baby cry? <laughs> it's so uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but yeah, all of that. And that, that, that whole section that we filmed that flashback, we rehearsed it like a play. I think a lot of it is oneers. There's like, it's maybe just shot in a series of a couple oneers. Um, and that is like 
that's like doing theater. That's like doing a play. The timing has to be. We did. They made the set 360, so we wouldn't have to. So, um, you know, normally you'll have only this half of the set looks like a set, and the crew is all over there, and all the cameras and the lights are all over there. But because we wanted to film it all around, um, every it was like a real coordinated dance um, that we really, really had to rehearse, and everything had to be done right just in one take and um so that was really a really special um opportunity i loved that we got to see them as young people that was so cool um i they put me in this wig that i have pictures of uh, my mom like in the 1980s and then or like in the 70s i guess because that was a the flashback um, and we have like the same hair we like look the same it's so funny <laughs> costumes and everything <sighs> oh my gosh I should have made that the last question but I just thought of something that I don't know whose team I'd be on if I didn't ask this because this has been bothering me for years <laughs> season four Donna's gotta watch and every time she goes into a meeting, she mm -hmm. flips it over. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like a flippable, reversible yes. watch. Yes. Is it yes. gears on the other side? And what's the deal with the yeah. watch? Okay, I picked that watch out. We, The production designer had that. They're like fancy, fancy watches. I wish I could remember what it's called. It's like a very fancy, it's like a Italiano Reverso or like something really cool. Um, and it's made to do that. It's um, got, I think they wrote it. Maybe they wrote it into the script and then the production designer got sent all of these um, gorgeous watches. Um, um, and we were just like watch shopping um, and yeah yeah so that that's how that happened I think they wrote it in the script and then we yeah like got to pick the watch but as I was always so scared to wear it I was like please take it away from me immediately it's like a very expensive watch I don't want to have that what what for you was the significance of that um I think the watch was partly like um, Donna liked fancy things Donna like finally achieved a place where she feels like she's supposed to like have fancy things. She's got the fancy things. Um, and then I think the flipping is fun. The flipping is a really good like gentle metaphor for all kinds of different things, you know, um, pick, pick what you like. But you know, um, I loved Rogers today was talking about the binary nature of the relationships. Um, there's something, you know, the flipping is like, you know, it's on or it's off. It's a zero or it's a one. Um, and or you know like she's now this person she's a uh, she's an executive she is a VC person she's the man in charge she's you know got it she's like um, and maybe maybe toggling back and forth between her um, sort of code switching it's like a like a tool for her to help her code switching she's like boss mode you know um, boss mode activated boss mode deactivated you know I don't know I don't know but um, maybe something like that oh, I've been wondering this for a long time so thank you for <laughs> indulging I'm so that. glad you got to talk to everybody was so you know we talked about production design a little bit everybody was so talented I'm glad you talked to, got to talk to um Kimberly Adams, um, she's so great. I have a sweatshirt upstairs here. I brought it. It's my Donna sweatshirt. She found it in a thrift store. It just said she didn't make it. It's just a vintage hoodie that says Donna on it, and I have it. I have it here. Yeah, it's so great. Um, and some of the other stuff that I just have around my house, like they made notepads for all of our different companies. Agec, I have like an Agec mug. Um, Cardiff Electric, some stuff. You guys with your Cardiff shirts are so cute. Um, <laughs> but I've got like pens. I've got like all like branded tech company stuff from fake tech companies. It's like the it's the best. It's so fun. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Thank you so much for first of all giving us so much of your time. But more importantly, for doing this show, for making this what it is. You guys, I can't believe you guys are still watching it and still talking about it. It's so, it means so much to me that the show continues to live and um, it's just incredibly moving. And thank you. Thank you for, you know, finding so much value in it. Thank you. And also thank you to the ATX Festival for making all of this happen. It's been thank wonderful. you, everybody.